Let us open our Bibles to the Gospel of John, chapter 12. The Gospel of John, chapter 12. I will read to you from verse 27 to verse 43, but our text is from verse 27 to verse 36. John, chapter 12, the verses 27 to 36. This is the Word of God. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save my soul from this hour. But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So, the crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him, so that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe, for again Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it. So they would not be put out of the synagogue, for they love the glory that comes from men more than the glory that comes from God. Let us pray. The Heavenly Father, we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would open your word to us and help us to see the truths that lie before us, that we might understand and worship you and be drawn closer to you. Father, speak to us by the Holy Spirit, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear friends, is Jesus human or divine? Is he the Son of Man, or is he the Son of God? Now, I think if I would ask you this question, you would all, of course, say as good students of theology that he is both 100% man and 100% God. And that is a true and biblical doctrine. That's true about Jesus, and it's true that the Bible says that about Jesus Christ. But what I have found is that as believers we are often a little unbalanced in the way we actually think about the Lord Jesus Christ outside our theological doctrinal statements. As some people, I think, are more focused on one of the Lord's natures than the other. So when we see the Lord Jesus Christ, we default to our most prominent view in our minds. Let me give you the idea of what I'm saying. For example, I think some are more focused on the divine nature of Christ. And so when they see the Lord Jesus Christ, they see him more as fully God rather than fully men. So when they see Jesus dying on the cross, they see God overcoming Satan. And when they see Jesus as the divine creator of all things, and they know that Jesus is able to bring them to their heavenly home. But when they take a look on Jesus' life on earth, they really see no comparisons to their life. After all, Jesus is God. So if Jesus didn't sin, of course he didn't sin because he was God. So when we come to a statement in Hebrews that he was tempted in all ways as we are tempted, we kind of, yeah, okay, he was, but he was God. So he, whenever he was tempted, he just tapped into his divine nature and overcame sin. And so 
Um, Jesus wasn't really tempted. Of course, we wouldn't say that, but the way we look at Jesus Christ, we did really see no comparison between how he walked on the earth and how we walk on the earth. And so their unbalanced view of Jesus Christ causes them to be discouraged by their walk on the earth. Because they say, we're just sinners. We walk in sin because we're just human. I know Jesus walked perfectly, but I can't walk without sin. I, I can't overcome my sin because I don't have that divine nature as Christ did. For others, the human nature of Jesus Christ is the main focus. They see how Jesus connects with them on a human level. They see how Jesus Christ became like them. They rejoice in the fact that Jesus took their place on the cross because he was a man like them. They're strengthened to know that Jesus has humbled himself to be like them so they could actually follow in the steps of Jesus Christ as he walked on the earth. They have a vivid understanding of Jesus' care for them as their closest brother and friend. For he's like them. He comes near to them. He's like a friend, a close companion that they could imitate and walk like. But they don't talk much about the divinity of Jesus Christ. They see Jesus as the, the troubled king, but not as the God to worship. And so you get terms like, Jesus is my buddy, or Jesus and I go about things this way. And Jesus is no longer the one before whom the angels drop and worship. And they do not fear or stand in awe of Jesus, but they see him more as a, a wonderful human being that, of course, in theology is God as well. Now, I think for most people in the Reformed Church, uh, like us, I think we would tend to see Jesus more in his divinity. We are more eager to emphasize that Jesus is fully God rather than fully man. The man side just comes in when we talk about that he died for us and he had to be man. But other than that, we put our understanding of Jesus' man in the closet as true doctrine right next to the other systematic theology books. But we, we see Jesus Christ on earth and in heaven as divine. And so we come to the point that we think he was never tempted nor never troubled. But then, and here we come finally to our first point, the troubled king. When we come to our text, we are confused. Because our text here is says very clearly that Jesus is troubled in his soul. How can God be troubled in his soul? How can this be? The same Greek word here for troubled, if we think that it's wrongly translated, uh, is actually the same word that is used for the disciples in Mark 6, verse 50. When the disciples saw Jesus walking on the water at night, and they thought there was a ghost coming to them. This is what it says. For they all saw him and were terrified. That's the same word. They were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Right? So the disciples, the same emotion that they had as they were terrified, and Jesus' antidote, so to speak, is don't be afraid. So this word that Jesus has here is either terrified or afraid or troubled. I think troubled is actually a very mild translation of this word. I think the word terrified here would actually fit much better. Jesus was terrified. Jesus has just finished saying, what? I know that most people who listen to sermons don't remember it for six days, right? Because you look forward to it the last three days of the week, so you forget whatever happened last week. But if I remind you, we spoke about Jesus that was, compared himself to a grain of wheat that fell in the ground and died. And Jesus sees that as he speaks to them, and he says, I will be like a grain of wheat that falls in the ground and dies. And as he ponders that, terror strikes his heart. He is afraid. He is terrified in his human flesh. He was really afraid. While I was preparing these words, I was struck with conviction and shame because I realized how easily I had read these words that he went into the ground and died. How easily I preach to you, how, how a little seed, and I almost made a joke, but like if I show you a seed, you wouldn't even see it. 
And then I realized when Jesus said the same words, it struck terror in his heart. And I had to repent for how flippantly I spoke about these things. Oh, my dear friends, none of us can begin to understand the terror and horror that Jesus saw before him. And he wasn't skating over it, flying over it in his divine power and say, okay, next stop, uh, this will be death and then resurrection. And uh, No, he was terrorized by what came to him. His soul was about to be burned alive under the hot and fiery wrath of God. He was about to be rejected by the very Father who said, This is my beloved Son, who I am well pleased, would turn his back to him and pour out the judgment. Jesus was about to face an eternity of hell pressed together in a few hours, being poured out upon his soul. And Jesus was terrified, shaken to the core of his being with fear. When Jesus saw the terror of his call, he feared it with the fear of human flesh. How you and I would have that fear. It's hard for us even to imagine, isn't it? That you knew that at the end of this week, judgment was coming upon your soul. That you at the end of this week would be nailed upon a cross and with the full force of God's wrath would be poured out into your soul. You see, it's amazing how Sometimes there's a lot of things now going on with the end times and Christians are afraid that they might not be able to buy something in the future. Do you see the terror of Christ, what he went through to save our souls? He was frightened more than you and I will ever be frightened to the point that he was sweating drops of blood while he prayed at the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was fully man. He did not coast upon his divine power as he bore the punishment for our sins. He bore the totality of this horrible outpouring of wrath in his human nature. For the Father had sent them to the earth as he gave his only begotten Son to bear the punishment. And as he saw all of this before him, he said these words to the Father, being a faithful king. A second point, the brave king. Can you imagine if you are terrified? And then verse 27 and 28. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And he, when we see this, what shall I say? We can read it like this. Right? Well, what shall I say? That's not what's going on. It's out of the terror and the fear. He says, what shall I say? With all this weight pressed upon, what shall I say? No, I'm not going to give in. I will glorify my Father. That's what he's saying. I will glorify. Father, save me. From, for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Oh, look at the braveness and obedience of King Jesus that we follow. As human beings follow a human king who is also fully divine. He looks at the Father while his heart is shaken with fear and terror and says, I have come to do your will. Glorify your name. Beloved, there is no better description for worship and obedience than these words of Jesus Christ. I think in all of Scripture that at this point, this is how he lives. You see, when we obey God, we do so because we know that he has promised to be with us until the end of the age. We worship him because he has first loved us. And he has given us a secure future. He says, I will be with you here. I will be with you in the end. I will, I will lead you all the way. Follow me. I've laid down the path. I'm preparing a place for you. He's constantly filling us with comfort so that we can worship him. We obey because God has promised that He is with us. We can do the work of the Lord because He has promised that He will be with us. But when Jesus was sent by the Father, He went to be rejected, to be despised, 
crucified and left by God to die by himself. And yet when Jesus sees all of this, he says, Father, I want to glorify your name. Make your love and glory to shine, O Father, for I have come to glorify your holy name through this act of love for you and for my people. I'm not going to turn away. I see the fullness of what is coming to me, and I will not turn left or right. Now, what does it mean to glorify the Father's name? How does the suffering of Jesus Christ give the Father glory? I think it is in this. The sacrificial love of the Son shows us the love of the Father. By Jesus Christ's act upon the cross, He shows what the Father is really like. Because the Father's heart is full of love for us, for sinners, so that He can prepare a way for us to come to Him. And Jesus Christ, in full agreement with His Father, having the same heart and the same love and the same desire, follows that to glorify His Father so that in the Father He is glorified and the perfect unity of God is seen on display where He is both righteous and pure. At the same time, He is loving and merciful and gracious. That's what Jesus is going to do on the cross to show the Father to the world. And the Father responds immediately from heaven. You can almost, if you picture this in a human way, Jesus is filled and terrified. He says, I'm going to glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, I will glorify it again. It's almost, and of course, we say that Jesus says, this is for you, not for me. But it can't be also say that the Father is eager to encourage the Son. That Jesus didn't need to know this. He knew this. And the people needed to know, but at the same time, don't we need to know it to understand the love between the Father and the Son? In other words, my Son, my name has been glorified to you already by your life upon this earth. And I will glorify it again by your act upon the cross. The Father fully embraces the Son's obedience and love and responds with an encouragement that his son is walking in righteousness. But his encouragement for Jesus was not merely for Jesus Christ, but especially for the people who were around them, so they might understand what was about to happen a few days later on Good Friday. Now, I want to take a little bit of a sidestep, and before we dive back in and continue on, don't you think, that those who believe in Jesus Christ are now covered with the righteousness of Christ. God sees them as His very own sons. Is this not the way He speaks to us? When we say, God, I desire to glorify Your name through my life. I think this is how the Lord responds, not by opening the heavens and speaking, but by bringing the truth of all the ages to our heart. You have been glorifying me by your life, and you will glorify me again. You see, sometimes I think we think the Christian life is, we made this huge debt, and then God paid for it, and now He's just bothered by still of our sins through our lives, and finally has to get us in heaven because He already paid the price. No. He loves the life of His people. He is the one who is encouraging the saints to walk with Him day by day. It's amazing, isn't it, sister? When you play the organ, you're glorifying God. And then you say, Father, help me to glorify your name. And he says, you have glorified me. You will glorify me again. If you're an elder, you say, oh, in all my frailty, in all my weakness, in all, all my lack of understanding, help me to glorify your name. And the Father says, you have glorified me, my brother, my son. And you will glorify it again. When you're a mother at home, or a grandmother, or a sister, and you say, oh, I've done so little. Help me to glorify your name. You have glorified it. And you will glorify it again. It's amazing, isn't it? When we look at it that way. I think sometimes we have such a picture 
Such a harsh picture of God, thinking that God is one who sits on the judge and is, is, has this perfect scanner and everything that doesn't come to the scanner of perfection just fails. Eh, out. No, I think I did a good work, but no, there's an evil thought in your heart. Eh, out. No way. God sees the work of His children. You know, when my son tries to bring his bowl of Cheerios back to the, back to the, the, the kitchen table, and he walks with it, but it's not empty. And he walks, and it's, he has this little penguin walk, right? And that's not good for milk in a bowl. And so when he spills it out, what am I going to say? What a, what a useless job you just did. Of course not. It's a great job, buddy. Now help, can you help me with another thing? There's some milk on the floor somehow. Let's clean it together. Right? Not of one good work, he somehow gets two good works and two stickers. Right? Isn't Christ, isn't the Father with us in the same way? We fail. He corrects us. He works on us. But at the same time, He rejoices in the work that we do. Anyway, I need to go back to the, the topic at hand. Now listen to how Jesus would glorify the Father. In John 12, verse 29 to 33, the crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. That's always curious to me. I think you've heard thunder before. Then there were two people are saying, I think it was an angel. I think it's thunder. I think the people who said it was thunder, they knew that something was there, but they didn't dare to recognize that it was God speaking. Anyway, others said an angel had spoken to him. The voice has come for your sake, Jesus said. Not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this earth world be cast out. And when I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So we come to our third point. The king would be exalted and its enemy destroyed. Jesus said, this voice was for you. So you who heard thunder, you've just missed the voice of God speaking to you. And then Jesus emphatically shows how he will be exalted. Now, if you were to write a book, and the first question of your book would go like this, how was Jesus Christ exalted on the cross? Or what did Jesus do on the cross? Or something in that way. How would you answer? I think what you would say is that on the cross, Jesus gave himself for our sins. Right? That's how Jesus is exalted on the cross. But now, this is, look at what Jesus says. Now is the judgment of the world. Jesus calls himself going to the cross the judgment of the world. That's curious, isn't it? That's not how we usually talk about it. We don't call Good Friday Judgment Day. But this is the judgment of the world. Now, what is this judgment that Jesus is speaking about? When you and I hear judgment, what do we think? Damnation, right? Judgment equals damnation, especially when we read it in scriptural terms. And so we think, didn't he come as a savior instead of a judge? Wasn't Jesus first coming, right? In nice theological terms, it's being mixed up now. The first coming is in mercy and salvation, and the second coming is in judgment. Why does Jesus now contradict my theology that the first coming is judgment as well? Well, I think we have to understand how the world is judged on the cross and how Jesus was bringing, being exalted through this judgment. And I think in order to understand that, we must understand a little bit more what the word judgment actually means in biblical terms. Right? It's the word uh, mishpat. And judgment there does not always speak about damnation. And actually, we can understand because in our day, the word judgment, the final judgment of a judge, does not always mean damnation, especially when there are two parties involved. No, judgment here does not only refer to condemnation, but also speaks about the act of setting things right. Right? If you have two people coming before a judge, uh, and the one person has stolen from the other person, the first person has to pay, and the second person what? Receives. And so Jesus says, now is the hour where I will set things right. I will judge and punish, and also I will restore and recover. And through the work of the cross, I will overcome evil 
and bring the work of restoration. And that way, we can understand that, right? Good Friday is a judgment day for evil and a salvation day for those who come to Him in need. So Jesus begins to explain right after this His double purpose for death. Let me see to you where that verse is. In verse 31, Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. The first reason for Jesus' death on the cross was to defeat Satan's power. You say, well, how can somebody be defeated by dying? You should have a war between two. The one who dies is automatically the loser and not the one who wins. This goes back all the way to Genesis 3. Do you remember? When man gave their worship instead of God, they gave their obedience to the serpent. And so the serpent, as they began to worship serpent, Satan. And so they gave up their privileged position before God by turning against Him. And, and that's what we all do when we're born, isn't it? We worship the serpent. We follow another way. We don't turn to God, but we turn another way. And ever since that sin, Satan has been ruling the world through sin. And so he has brought in death. So the world is following the serpent through temptation and lust. And so up to the worship, the worship of God for the worship of Satan. But on the cross, what happened? On the cross, Jesus came to pay the price and to destroy the work of Satan, which is sin and death. And so the clutches that Satan had to keep people to himself by sin and death, Jesus Christ came and took that upon himself, took it to the grave, and destroyed it by the resurrection. And so Jesus Christ here comes to judge Satan on the cross and be the one who overcomes. And so Jesus stripped away the rights of Satan by purchasing mankind's sin and destroying the sting of sin, which is death. And as Jesus destroyed sin, darkness, and death on the cross, Satan was now the one who was the great perpetrator and the great one of evil. And Satan can no longer accuse believers of sin, nor that he owns them through their obedience of sin, and so Satan's kingdom is destroyed. Now, if you're a Christian, and you can connect but all of that, what I just said way too quick, and can connect that to your own soul. What it means is this, that the dictator who ruled your life was destroyed upon the cross so that now you can walk with your faithful Savior day in, day out, and sing songs to Him. It's amazing, isn't it? That Christ destroyed the work of Satan upon the cross. And so now Satan has been defeated and his power is severely limited until the day that God will cast him into the pit of destruction forever and all those who did not turn to Christ. And therefore, dearly beloved, when Jesus went to the cross, he went to take down Satan from his throne, even the throne upon the hearts of his people. And defeat our greatest enemy once and for all. Satan was condemned through the cross. But Jesus did not only go for Satan's condemnation, for listen, it continues. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. As a king unites the people on his throne, so Jesus Christ unites the people. But he's not sitting on a throne. He is hanging upon a cross. And He brings the people to Himself through the cross. Do you see that? And of course, now He is from the cross. He is raised alive and sits upon the throne. But it is the cross that is the entrance to His kingdom. And so in a real way, it's upon the cross that people, is, that people are coming to Jesus Christ. You know, it's amazing when you travel around the world and you meet people from every kind of color and language and things like that. And, and if they're in Christ, it means they've all come to that same cross. They've all come to the Lord who hung upon the cross and then was raised to life. 
And upon that same cross, people from China, from America, from Europe, from the Middle East, from North Korea, South Korea, they're saved by that same man and God that hung upon the cross. And so here we have it fulfilled right before us. Well, last week we saw that Jesus was inviting the whole world. Do you remember that? We saw that He was the King of Israel. Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. And then we saw these Greeks coming to Him, and Jesus said He was going to the whole world from every place they could come to Him. And then John adds, He said this when He comes, sorry, come back to our text. He said this to show by what kind of death He was going to die. On the cross, Jesus was lifted up from the earth, literally, upon a wooden cross to die for the world. And it is through that cross that Jesus will draw man to Himself. Now, He doesn't mean all men without exception, because there's many people who reject the cross. There's many people in Jesus' time who rejected the cross when He was hung upon the cross. It doesn't mean all people without exception will come to the cross for forgiveness. What he's speaking is this, all people without distinction from every kind of people, all kinds of people, whether you be the Philistines, whether you be the descendants of Goliath, or whether you be the descendants of David, whether you be the the descendants of Esau or the descendants of Jacob, All kinds of people will come to the cross and be saved so that in heaven it's a colorful feast of new people. I'm not sure. Maybe in heaven we'll all have a glowing color of of brightness and whatever kind. But it's the people that are brought together from every nation, tribe, and tongue. And quite honestly, when John was writing this, he couldn't say that with the same boldness as we can say it today other than by the Spirit of God. Because we see it. Isn't that amazing? There's Christians in the Amazons. There's Christians in the Himalayas. There's Christians in every part of the world that John had never heard about. It's amazing, isn't it? And Jesus is coming to you and to me. And the question is, have you come to the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you been to the cross? Have you come to the foot of the cross and called upon the Lord for salvation? Oh, I believe I sing hanging there, looking at your face through the corridors of time and say, you as well, my loved one. You as well, come to me. You as well, I will set you free. I am hanging here for you, my friend. I bore this for you. I have come to wash you with my blood. I have come to clean you from all your sins, and I know the sins. Don't be ashamed of the sins to me, but bring them to me. I know them better than you. But come to me. I'm drawing you. Isn't that amazing? Christ is drawing people today at this very hour to come to Him and be saved. Now, I want to give you the final understanding today of our King, the urgent King. Well, look at the urgent call from our text in verse 35 and 36. Jesus said to them, The light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in the darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. I believe Jesus is speaking this right now as well. Don't wait any longer. For now you can see clearly the gospel through my words. Now you can see the light of the world, Jesus Christ. Now in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, Paul writes many years later after the crucifixion, the resurrection, and the Pentecost that believers are the children of light. Paul is speaking there of believers who have become followers of Jesus Christ. 
And so before the resurrection, Jesus says, walk in the light that you may become sons of light. After the resurrection, Paul writes, you have become sons of light. And here in our text, Jesus speaking to the crowds that are before the cross and the resurrection. And we see with great pain in our hearts that afterwards many people didn't believe in him. So Jesus is urging them to start walking now. To start following him now. Because the light is here. Now what does Jesus mean by walking? Does it mean now you have to get up and walk out of the church somewhere and just keep walking until you find light somewhere? Of course not. Well, look at the first few verses back in John 12, verse 26. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, or he must walk after me. And where I am there, my servant will be also. At this very moment, they were to walk after Jesus Christ. They were to follow in his footsteps and see where Jesus was going because there their salvation would be. Now, what does the word glorify remind you of? Literally, it's a, a shining of light, right? When you have a, a dark stage and a singer or, or an entertainer comes up and the spotlight is on and the whole room is dark and only that person is in the light, then that person is glorified, right? It's illumined. It's, it's, you can see that person. The focus is upon that person. And what Jesus tells these people is, you have the light now because you hear my voice. You hear my words. But walk in light, keep following me, and you will understand and become children of light because you will see me upon the cross. And that's why you become children of light. Because out of the resurrection, I will give light and I will make you like me because I will pour out my Holy Spirit and make you mine. And so Jesus is saying quite literally to these people, keep your eyes on me. Keep following me until you can see the fullness when Jesus is glor when God is glorified upon the cross. And so the cross is not dark Gethsemane, but glorifying God Gethsemane. For there we see the light of the world in its full brightness as he calls other people to himself. And so it's almost like a like we're like the cross is a burning fire that doesn't consume. And when we come there as little sticks and you put it in the fire, that you yourself become a light. Where God is upon you as the burning bush of Moses that was on fire but was never consumed. In the same way, if we come to Christ at the cross, we become living fires because the Holy Spirit comes upon us. And we become glorifiers of God as well. And so Jesus is urging our generation in the same way today. Now is the time to follow Jesus. And if you walk with Jesus, rejoice and walk as Jesus in the light. America and our world is quickly changing. Today the gospel is still freely preached, but for how long will it be? How long will this burning and bright light of the gospel will still light in America until there be false gospels everywhere and it be hard even to hear the truth of God's word being faithfully preached. And Jesus tells us now to come to him, now for tomorrow it might be too late. Not just because the preaching might be gone, but your heart might have hardened itself. Who knows, my dear friends, whether there will be a tomorrow for you? Who knows whether there'll be a day after today? Who knows, my dear friends, whether tomorrow your heart will be open for Christ? If you're in Christ, you know the love of God, don't you? Because the love of God has been poured out through the Holy Spirit inside you. And would you ever want to live a day without Christ? If that means that you can run after the lust of the world, would you ever? Would you give up anything for the love of Christ in your heart? I know you wouldn't. Because I know that everyone who is tasted from the sweetest of fruits in Christ would never want any more of the trash of the world and the rottenness and perversion. But oh, if you don't know Christ, 
if you still think there is sweetness to find in the world, listen to the old man and the gray hair who has walked with Christ all his life. Or listen to the young boy who has just come to Christ and find in him the sweetest. There's men and women from every age that know the sweetness of Christ. Don't be fooled by darkness, but walk in the light. There is no delight and joy outside of Christ that is lasting and full of peace. My dear friends, we live in a quickly changing world where the end is coming near. Days, years, months, millenniums? I don't think so. I think we are near. And at this late hour, isn't this the best time now to come to Christ? And now to walk in the light? Isn't this what preachers have been telling for years, that tribulation might come, or difficulty or hardship might come? This is the day to shine the light of Christ, even if there is another 500 years to come. This is our day to shine the light of Christ. This is our day to show that Christ is more important than our lives, that we love Him because He first loved us. Jesus suffered as a man for man and prayed the price to God as God. Beloved, never be fooled by your own theology, which is in word correct, but in your heart is not, and think that you cannot overcome sin because Jesus was coasting on divinity. Jesus walked as a man and fought sin as a man and overcame as a man. And this when we connect to Christ, that we can overcome our sin. Oh yes, we're still foolish in many ways, and we might fall, but don't ever be caught in sin and think there is no way out. For Christ is light. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you to walk with you, to follow you, for you are the light of the world who shines in the darkness. Father, we pray that by your Holy Spirit you would draw us nearer to this King who is brave, who is humble, who urges us to come to him today. Father, I pray that you would encourage your people and draw those who know you're not, that they might be saved. For we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.